Hi, I'm your host, Larissa Worstiak. Through this podcast, I aim to empower and inspire jewelry entrepreneurs and professionals so they can thrive while adding more beauty to the world. I'm passionate about digital marketing for jewelry brands, and I'm excited to share my passion with you. As we all know, jewelry is joy, and so I'll gladly seize any opportunity to talk about it. This is episode 167, and today I'm going to be sharing my interview with Jessica Totello Coster, the founder of e-commerce badassery. Jessica's an e-commerce and email marketing strategist for boutique owners and product entrepreneurs. She uses data and her experience to help her clients figure out the next best steps in their business. She's also the host of the e-commerce badassery podcast. Not only was Jessica at one point the only employee of a seven-figure e-commerce store managing e-commerce, marketing, and more, but she was also the owner of her own multi-six-figure brick-and-mortar clothing boutique. She's cut her teeth in e-commerce and digital marketing, and she's learned all the best practices by finding innovative solutions to marketing challenges, even by, as she says, being scrappy. You'll probably catch on in this hour-long conversation that Jessica and, Jessica and I have a lot of synergy and that we really both like to nerd out on digital marketing, especially when it comes to marketing for e-commerce brands. We're going to cover topics like which is the best e-commerce platform and why, the top e-commerce best practices, a no-nonsense way to plan your email marketing calendar, tips for building an email list, mistakes to avoid in email marketing, and more. I hope you're prepared to take some notes because you're going to get a lot of actionable tips and advice. Also, Jessica has a free gift for Joy Joya listeners and viewers, so make sure to listen through to the end to get that gift. But before we get to the solid gold of this episode, I'd like to take a moment to remind you that this podcast has both an audio and video component, so you can either listen on your favorite podcast platform or watch on YouTube by searching Joy Joya. I love creating this content as my act of service to you, my awesome listeners, and you can support the podcast for free by taking the time not only to subscribe, but also to leave a rating and review on iTunes, which helps other jewelry dreamers find it too. I also wanted to mention, if you listen to episode 165 with my guest Liz Kantner, you know that we recently opened registration for our collaborative six-part webinar series called Success with Jewelry. If you want to know what that's all about, definitely go back and listen to that episode. But I do want to remind you that registration is open right now. And if you want all the details, you can follow us on Instagram at Success with Jewelry or visit successwithjewelry.com. In this segment of the podcast, I give out my Sparkle Award for the week. During this segment, I highlight a jewelry brand that's really been impressing me with their marketing. The Sparkle Award is also interactive, so you can visit sparkleaward.com to nominate a jewelry brand that's inspiring you too. And I might feature your submission on a future podcast episode. This week, I'm highlighting The Last Line, which is a jewelry brand co-founded by Shelly Sanders, who's now also the creative director. The brand is based in LA, but they pretty recently opened their first brick and mortar store in New York City. I found myself looking at their homepage the other day, which you can also view yourself at thisisthelast.com, and I was so impressed with how they handle visual merchandising on a digital platform. The homepage is merchandised in such a fun way, making the shopping experience truly enjoyable and exploratory. Like I'm walking through my favorite jewelry store, but on the internet. They have sections for things like their latest drop, turn up the charm, which is all their charm jewelry, big love for their statement earrings, four pieces we never take off and more. If you really want to be inspired by merchandising or you want ideas for how you can merchandise your e-commerce store, 
then definitely visit thisisthelast.com. I'll include the link and a screenshot in the show notes as well so you can see what I'm talking about. As I mentioned, you can visit sparkleaward.com to nominate a jewelry brand that's been inspiring you and I might feature your submission on a future episode. Let's discuss some recent news related to jewelry or marketing. Each week I share my thoughts about three relevant articles and you can get those links yourself by visiting joyjoya.com slash sign up. Once you're on that VIP list, you'll receive our weekly digest filled with new episode announcements. So the first article comes from Yahoo Finance, and it's all about everyone's favorite topic, Instagram and how the algorithm works. So basically, the head of Instagram, Adam Masseri, recently answered some questions from users about Instagram, and he revealed in this conversation that hashtags don't really help views. However, instead, They help users understand what a post is about, making that post more likely to pop up in a hashtag page. So basically, it's kind of affirming what I think we already knew, but maybe we had higher hopes about hashtags, like they would help boost engagement or reach in some way. But I think hashtags are absolutely still important because if someone is searching Instagram for something specific, you are much more likely to come up under that hashtag in the search results if you're using that hashtag. And it kind of brings relevance to your post. It helps, it can potentially help people discover you. So I think it's important, you know, there's a lot of mystery around Instagram. I'm glad that Adam Masseri is being transparent in answering people's questions. It helps users like you really understand how the app works. The next article is from JCK online and it's about the LVMH acquisition of Tiffany and company. Basically the headline is that two thirds of Tiffany staff departed in the year after the acquisition. So why am I sharing this? It's kind I mean, it's kind of a bummer news that there's so much staff turnover. I think something like this is not unexpected when there's an acquisition. But the thing that was most interesting to me about this article is that President and CEO Anthony Ledru told Women's Wear Daily that Tiffany is looking for workers in the, quote, wider fashion industry that could bring, quote, a faster pace of thinking. He points out that this faster pace of thinking is an important skill set to have in the fashion industry as it's a fast moving world. I don't know if that was like a unintentional jab at the jewelry industry. I mean, is he saying that people with jewelry industry experience are not as fast thinking as people in the jewelry space? I also think it's interesting that they're looking to bring on people with fashion industry experience because I think a lot of people in the jewelry industry forget that in the end of the day, it is kind of part of the fashion industry there it does have a lot to do with trends with color with styling with looks and people tend to be so like insulated in this jewelry space that they they forget the big picture of how consumers are wearing shopping and buying so I personally think this is a really smart outlook and I really look forward to seeing how this hiring philosophy changes and evolves the company. And finally, this last article was from Women's Wear Daily, and it it is called Stephen Lucier on Diamonds, Dreams, and the Economy of Desire. Wow, what a intriguing article title. After 37 years of being De De Beers Group's executive vice president for brands and consumer markets, Stephen Lucier will be leaving the role on April 1st, but he will continue to be a strategic advisor to De Beers as well as continuing to serve as chairman of the Natural Diamond Council. He also recently received at the um, gala organized by Jewelers of America the 2022 Gem Award for Lifetime Achievement. I love this article because this interview with Stefan kind of gave some really interesting insights into marketing and positioning for diamonds. 
So what what does he see as some of the biggest changes in marketing diamonds in recent years? Well, one, he says, quote, brands need to ensure they are making decisions based on the values that consumers hold, end quote. And two, the biggest change that Stefan noticed after working nearly four decades in diamond marketing was that now more than ever, brands are prioritizing their customers, clients' values, and directly responding to those needs. The article notes that the U.S. continues to be the largest market for diamonds in the world, accounting for half of global diamond consumption, but De Beers has really been working hard to create demand in other parts of the world. So one example that Stefan talks about is creating demand for diamonds or what he calls, quote, the diamond dream in other markets such as India and China. So in China, one thing that they did was made advertisements more localized and then inserted diamond culture into the lives of the Chinese people. Today, China probably accounts for 20% of global diamond jewelry consumption, so $15 billion. The market went from zero to being the number two market in the world. So it sounds like they know what they're doing. Another thing that he brings up in this interview is the Forever Mark brand. So the change in De Beers' business model was driven by a number of things, including the conflict diamond issue. They really created a new way of marketing, which led to the concept of the Forever Mark brand, which you've probably heard of before and familiar with. That was launched in 2008, and it's really been a marketing tool that reinforces the core values of diamonds and a way to help com the company sell diamonds from their own production. They've also had this new code of origin pilot program. So they've been testing this code of origin program for the last 18 months and Lucier announced that it will be ready in April or May of this year. So here's a quote from the interview. De Beers will work with their site holders to upload info about the diamonds on the blockchain and then inform the retailers how they can find a diamond's history. They will have a certificate linked to a Q QR code that can open up content about the journey of the diamonds. In addition, he touched upon the the light box brand that De Beers have. So De Beers knew that natural diamonds and lab grown diamonds would eventually diverge and they saw that opportunity to launch the light box lab grown diamond brand. Lucier in this interview mentioned that quote light box is an opportunity to be an honest broker with a consumer and transparent about what lab grown diamonds are. And of course, they've really been focusing on their sustainability goals and strategies. So they've been focusing specifically their efforts on climate change. They're developing their own sources of renewable energy from solar and wind. And another thing that they are working on is converting all their trucks from diesel to electric. The greatest takeaway from this interview, I was super inspired by this article, by the way. He says... You need to inspire people, give them a vision and inspire them, make sure they understand what the dream is. And that can apply both to your internal messaging, to your team members, and also externally to consumers. As I mentioned, if you want to get the links to the articles I share in this segment of the podcast, you can become a Joy Joya VIP by visiting joyjoya.com slash sign up. Without further delay, let's get to my interview with Jessica. Hey, Jessica, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm excited to have you as a guest today and to share your knowledge with the listeners. Thanks so much for having me, Larissa. I could talk about this stuff all day long, so okay. I'm super excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> awesome. So tell our listeners a little bit, how and when did you first enter this world of, quote, e-commerce, <laughs> badassery, and what does that mean to you? Yeah, that's such a great question. So technically, I started this business by accident. If you remember back when Shopify and MailChimp broke up and there were, you know, every e-commerce entrepreneur was like, I don't know what to do. And so at the time, I was still working full time running an e-commerce business and I was hanging out in all these entrepreneurial Facebook groups because I just really love to be around that energy. And I knew I wanted my own business, but I didn't know what it was going to be. 
So I started talking to people about Klaviyo because I had already been using it for probably three years at that time. And then people started, and I was just commenting, right? Like just saying, hey, try this. And then people started messaging me saying, oh, I'm on Klaviyo or I'm trying to move, but I really don't understand it. Can you help me? So I was like, huh, okay, sure. And I had those, it was like my first two OG clients. And I was like, this is the best job I've ever had. Like, why haven't I been doing this already? And I remember sitting on the couch with my husband and I was telling him about it. And he was asking me, you know, aren't you tired? Because I was working full time and it was a very demanding job. And then I would come home and work on the client stuff. And I said, no, actually I'm re-energized when I work on that stuff. And he was like, so are you going to start a business or, so I hate admitting that it was actually his idea, <laughs> but I just didn't think that people would pay me for something I knew how to do so easily. Right. Yeah. Like Cause it was obvious own, to you. <laughs> yes. Like we take our own knowledge for granted. So that's something for everyone to think about is you feel like everyone knows what you know. That's not true <laughs> at all. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of how e-commerce badassery started. But in terms of what it means to me, you know, when I was working at that other e-commerce business, it was a seven figure business. I was technically the only, you know, the only W2 employee. And we worked with a bunch of consultants and I felt like none of them really cared about me and how I was going to manage the things that they were doing after the fact. It's like they wanted me to be reliant on them. And I'm scrappy enough to one, know the right questions to ask. I'm not shy. I push back. Right. But I know not everyone is like that. And so for me, it's about being dangerous enough in your own business. Like you don't have to be an expert at everything, but you need to know enough that you know when someone else is like BSing you. <laughs> so it was really important to me to teach people things like SEO and email marketing, because not a lot of people are talking about that. Not for that mid-level e-com entrepreneur who's already doing like multi-six going into seven figure. So, you know, not all consultants are bad by any means, but I do think that to be a CEO, you have to really like take ownership over every facet of your business. And I just want to be a little part of that. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And at some point on this podcast, I've talked about this before that if you really, when it comes to marketing, if you want to make sure that you are spending your budget wisely, you at least have to take the time to understand what marketing means. Because like right. you said, someone might take advantage of you or like try to convince you into something that isn't really right. So you don't have yeah. to be the expert at it, but at least know <laughs> when someone is BSing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And look, there are wonderful service providers out there. There really are, but there's some really crappy ones too. And there are some people who are just good at marketing themselves, right? But not actually doing the job. And I know that because one, I've worked with them, but two, because I see when clients come to me, I'm often fixing a lot of that other stuff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So why are you passionate about specifically supporting e-commerce businesses? So it's actually less about e-commerce business. It's really about my ultimate goal. The, the thing that I want to do, why e-commerce badassery exists is to put more money in the pockets of female entrepreneurs. Okay. I my, love that. My vehicle for doing that is e-commerce because that's what I know, sure. right? So I've been in retail 20 plus years, um, e-commerce, gosh, maybe I'm going on eight or 10, not really sure. It's all a little bit blurry. Um, that's the thing that I know that I can do and where I can bring the value. Sure. So what specific um, services are you offering to bring that value to these female entrepreneurs? So it really started with setting up Clavio automations, which I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit today, but really it was teaching people the platform, setting up the automations, building out the strategy and all of that good stuff so that every 
e-commerce business owner can make money on autopilot because who doesn't want to do that, right? Get those Sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, get those cha-chings while we're sleeping. Um, and then what happened was as I was working with my first few clients, I was like, oh, I think I think she could use some help with SEO. And oh, I think she could actually use some help with more general marketing and just strategy, like where, what are their best next steps? And so I started having those conversations. And it's funny because if you go to my website and you go to like the get e-commerce help page, the headline literally says e-commerce is hard because that's what everybody was telling me. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, I still do those email setups and that's like the, I'm known as the Clavio girl around the internet, but I also do one-on-one -on -one consulting where we just meet once a week for four months and work out all your best next steps in business. 98% of the time, the biggest focus becomes SEO and email. Cause those are the two things that, you know, people are just not teaching as heavily. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So since you are an expert in e-commerce, at least working with a lot of business owners focused there. I want to chat about e-commerce platforms because <laughs> I, one, I get this question a lot, like which, which e-commerce platform should I use? And they, a lot of people are confused about the differences between one or the other. So which platform do you recommend and why? Yes. Hands down Shopify is my number one. And here is why, because one, it was built specifically for e-commerce. Now this is not to say the other platforms are bad, but that's not what they were built for. It's kind of the same way I feel about MailChimp and a lot of email marketing platforms, right? They started out as this general email platform and then they're like, oh, let's add on some e-commerce features. And I would rather see you on a platform that was built specifically for e-commerce. Every decision they make, every feature that they develop, right, is designed to help you sell more product. The other way I like to think about this is, so I was a late adopter to the iPhone and Macs in general. I didn't switch to the iPhone until about generation five for two main reasons. One, I didn't want to give up a real keyboard right? I was like, oh, and because everyone was on iPhone and they were all like, they'd get personally attacked. Like they would feel personally attacked if you didn't also love iPhone. I'm like, why is everyone taking this so seriously? But eventually I got so annoyed that all of the new apps came to iPhone first. And then as an Android user, you have to wait for like a year. I was like, this is stupid. So I switched Shopify is the e-commerce platform equivalent. Yeah, to that, that's a right? great analogy. So when Facebook released Facebook shops, who did they integrate with first? Shopify. You know, there's so many apps and functionalities that can get added on and you have so much more choice in the Shopify ecosystem. And really it takes away all of the headache. So even in the business that I used to work in, I was not responsible for the initial setup. They had worked with the consultant because I was already working in the company in a different position. So I didn't have time to do that. And they put us on Magento. Uh. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, I think we were getting hacked and our website was down more than we were up and making money. Oh, boy. Right? It was such a headache. We didn't have the internal tech team to manage it. We were outsourced. It was such a mess. And then I remember a new chief technology officer came in and was like, you guys got to make the switch, right? So we made the switch to Shopify and, I, and he didn't stay for very long, but I am forever grateful for him because he changed my work life, right? Like I didn't have to worry about the tech. I could just focus on selling my product. Totally. You know, if you're some big business and you have the tech team and all that, and you want to be on WooCommerce, whatever, cool. But I'll tell you, like if Shopify is good enough for Steve Madden and the Kardashians and the Jenners, like, I think it's good enough for us. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with all your points. And I would say the exact same thing. Yeah. I like to talk in terms of bagels and coffee because I'm very passionate about those things. So it's like, <laughs> would you rather go 
to a bagel shop for a bagel or would you rather go to a coffee shop that decided to like offer bagels because they needed food if you wanted right. a bagel <laughs> so that's yeah. how I see it I would rather go to the bagel shop but 100 <laughs> percent agreed so what in your mind if you could pick five of the most essential e-commerce best practices what would they be if if only our listeners can focus on five things, what would you say they are? <laughs> okay. They're probably not going to be what you think they are. Oh, Maybe I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> so the number one thing is to get really intimate with your numbers and to understand the levers that you have to pull in your business. So for instance, I get a lot of people who will come to me, ask me, and they're like, you know, I really, how can I improve the conversion on my website? I'm like, well, what's your conversion rate? And they say 3%. I'm like, well, here's the thing. The average e-com conversion rate is only one to 3%. You're already at the top of that. Now, granted, the smaller assortment you have, the more niche you are, maybe you're going to get up to a 5% and then the wider you'll be closer to that 1%. But ultimately, you don't have a conversion problem. You have a traffic problem or an AOV problem. So we get caught up in- And AOV is average order value, just yes. for people who don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Um you know, then they just get caught up in like tinkering with every last thing on their website. That's a complete waste of time and doesn't move the needle because the conversion is fine. Now that doesn't mean there isn't room to improve it, but you're not going to see as big of a jump, right? Or you're not going to move forward as quickly when you're focusing on the things that are already working. Totally. Um, that's not always the case. I would say the opposite in marketing, but you know, <laughs> bear with me guys. Um, so that's really the first thing I, you know, once you understand, okay, my conversion is good. Now I have to grow my traffic. Then you can think about how do I do that? And then, you know, pick two or three things to focus on to drive traffic instead. So I want you to get really comfortable with that stuff, do the research, get the benchmark so that you know what you're up against. Number two build an email and SMS list. Yes. Ultimately at the end of the day, it's the only thing you own, right? When Instagram is down for a day, you need a way to communicate with your customers. And even if you are selling on a platform like Etsy, you know, I, I don't know all the rules of Etsy. Um, that's not my jam, but there are ways that you can on social media, push people to sign up for your email list. So definitely focus on building that list you don't want to build your entire business on rented land. Mm -hmm. Number three, which is the, I think most underrated is collaborate with complementary companies and get in front of other people's audiences. That's essentially, Love it. <laughs> that's essentially what we're doing here, right? Larissa needs content for her podcast. I need to get in front of other people. So here I am sharing the value. And you guys can do that too. There are so many small product-based businesses out there. And, you know, you don't have to collaborate with a direct competitor, someone who sells a different product to the same person. Exactly. Is kind of the goal there. Um, it's truly the fastest way to get more eyes on your business. And I always kind of ask people when they're like, how do I, you know, grow traffic or get more customers? I'm like, well, do you have more time or do you have more money? If you have more money, go run ads, right? If everything else is good in the background, then just run ads. Don't think of it as a band-aid because ads will kind of <laughs> amplify whatever's going on in your business, good or bad. Otherwise, you need to go the organic route and collaborations is going to be way faster than like posting on Instagram. Sure. <laughs> and I think it has other benefits too. I mean, if you are making an active effort to network with other business owners that share your target customer, not only do you get that exposure, but you can share information. You can yes. like um, compare experiences. You can talk about that target customer. There is only positive things that can come from that. 100%. I mean, this whole online business thing, it can get freaking lonely, yeah. you know? So, I mean, it's funny because 
at this point in my life, most of my friends, they've either, and I live in Los Angeles, which is a very transient place, right? People come in and out, nobody really stays. So all the people I was friends with, a lot of them have moved away or they've moved further away from where I actually live. And anyone who lives or has been to LA, no, you don't drive that far here because everything <laughs> yeah. takes forever. It's like, oh, you're not in a two mile radius, probably not going to see you for like three months. Mm -hmm. So I have all of these online business friends and because they understand what I'm doing, like your friends don't get like, oh, you have this business on the internet and like, you don't go into an office and wait, what? So to have that community for yourself is, oh my gosh, it's such a lifesaver in those days when you really want to just throw in the towel and say, screw it. I'm going to go get a job, right? There yeah. you're kind of your saving grace. <laughs> yeah. And I think especially like speaking specifically to listeners in the jewelry industry, one negative thing I see in the jewelry community, there's a lot of positive, but one negative thing is I think they start they're so insulated in the jewelry space that they can't like see the forest for the trees as it is. <laughs> right. And like collaborating with business owners who have different products, but share similar customers, like say it's a beauty brand or a fashion brand or a home yeah. accessories brand, you can really step outside of the jewelry industry and see a perspective that um, otherwise you you're blind to because you're so in this product space. Yes. Yes. I love that. It really does. We can get so, I mean, I, here's the thing. I always tell people, keep your eyes on your own paper, right? Like you don't want to be looking at your competitors all the time, but at the same time, you can't be total ton tunnel vision because you're missing out on so much value. And there's a reason why people who, you know, invest in masterminds, like the big guys, that's what they're doing because they know they don't know it all. And they know that they need someone to kind of uncover their blind spots for them and things like that. So there's just so much value in creating that community and whatever it is that you are feeling in your business, they are too, even if they're not talking about it, they're feeling it too. <laughs> yeah, it's very true. I forget what number we're on. <laughs> that was number three. Okay. I have notes. I have notes. <laughs> so number four is to not project your own feelings onto your customers. Mm -hmm. And this can manifest in a few different ways. I see a lot of people say, oh, I hate pop-ups. I don't want to put one on my website. Just because you hate pop-ups doesn't mean your customer hates pop-ups. And ultimately, they're still one of the best ways to grow your list. Um, so I encourage you to just kind of like your business isn't about you. It's about your customer. So think about them first. And the other way I see this happen is with sending emails at all. Most, and I think this was actually one of the questions you sent me, but like some of the biggest mistakes is just not sending enough emails because you don't like getting emails but remember, it's not about you. It's about them. Like they're, just, they raise their hand. They're waiting for you to tell them what you have and what's going on in your business. And then the other way I see this happen is in the pricing of your product. Yeah. People are, I think, afraid or concerned or don't think that their customer is going to spend as much for their product. And there's probably a whole lot of mindset stuff that goes into that but there have been studies and I don't remember all the details. And one of them was actually specific to jewelry. I feel like maybe she was in a brick and mortar. It was a jewelry designer. She had this product that she was trying to sell, trying to sell. She kept marking it down, marking it down, marking it down, could not move it. Eventually she did the opposite and she raised the price like five times, sold it the first day because there's so much in the perception of value with your pricing. So, you know, that could be a whole other episode. Yeah. But don't... That's from a book that I have is... like within reach somewhere. And I can't yeah, remember the what, title what of it. That? And I know exactly what you're talking about. Is that maybe blue, o blue ocean? It's not blue ocean. It's not it's, uh, something about either persuasion or, yes. but I'll look it up and like link it in the show notes. Cause literally probably if I reached this way, I can get it, but I don't want to mess up the recording. <laughs> Fair enough. But yeah. So, um, yeah. So don't just assume, and it, you know, from obviously I'm a service provider, but there's a lot of, you know, coaches or 
experts in the space who say like, don't assume how much your clients can afford to pay you. Mm -hmm. And I want you to think of that same thing when you're thinking about pricing your product. So take your feelings out of it. You got to strip the emotion out and just be really objective about your customers. And that leads me into number five, which is getting to know your customers really, really intimately and well, like way more than you think you need to know them. (laughs) Understanding the problems and desires they have and the outcome that they're looking for from your product. And I know if you're a jewelry seller, you're like, well, I don't really solve a problem. Well, that's kind of true, but not really. There's still an outcome. There's a reason why we choose to use jewelry and it's about how we feel when we wear it. And I'll give you a very random example. So there is this jewelry brand. She puts a lot of profanity on her product and I am a potty mouth, which I'm keeping it clean (laughs) for this podcast. But when I wear her stuff, nobody else can see what it says unless they're really close to me. And if they're that close, then they're probably too close. Yeah. (laughs) But I know what it says. Right. And I'm like, when I, if I encounter someone who's grumpy that day, I'm like, (laughs) my necklace is talking to you. Right. So it's like that internal feeling and dialogue. And that, I mean, that is why we wear that kind of stuff. So think about the end user and why they even bother. Cause here's the thing. If it was just about not being naked, like we would all just wear like $5 t-shirts and (laughs) sweatpants probably, but it's not, it's about so much more than that. So really dig into that because once you understand that everything else in your business is so much easier. Your marketing is easier. Your decision-making is easier because you're just like, hey, how would my customer feel about this? Yeah, it all goes back to the customer. Yeah. Those were great points. Thank you. (laughs) I loved it. So transitioning a little bit from e-commerce into email marketing, which is one of my favorite things to talk about these days. I find myself really been digging into it a lot. Um, So I'd love to focus on that. And I know you've driven some really great results for your clients, specifically with Clavio. So Mm -hmm. tell me about, you have a system that you use, correct? Yes. Let's hear about that. Yes, absolutely. So it's called the star method and it wasn't always called that. I made that up because I love a good anagram. Is that what it is? Every time I have to ask, because I forget. I think acronym. Oh, maybe you're right. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? I love one of those. Uh, but this is the exact process that I used to use to create my email marketing calendar. When I was working at my day job, which this was only one of 50 hats that I wore. And, you know, we had a really wide product assortment and 200,000 active subscribers, and we couldn't advertise on social media. So email was a really important channel for us. And so I spent a lot of time optimizing not only my experience and how I was going to manage this, but, you know, the subscribers too. So this is how I like to approach email because so many entrepreneurs tell me, I don't know what to say. And that is why they don't send email. So this process kind of one makes it way easier, but two is going to fill your email marketing calendar so much faster than you think. So I want you guys to picture you're looking at a monthly calendar. I like to do this minimum a month at a time quarterly. If you could do a whole quarter, even better, obviously you'll go in and refine it, but I want you to have that visual picture. So the first thing, this is the star method. So the S, right? We're going to set the foundation with all of your important dates. So those are going to be your calendar holidays, like Mother's Day, St. Patty's Day. Then you're going to layer in all of your social media holidays and you just pick the ones that are relevant to your business. So, you know, that's like National Cookie Day and I can't think of any others because I'm on the spot on the podcast. Uh, (laughs) There's some weird ones out there. There definitely are some weird ones. Then you're going to put in, and I'm just double checking my notes. I have the order right here. Then I'm going to add in any business events or workshops, or if you're doing markets, anything like that, 
layer those dates in. Next up, put in your product launches and don't forget to leave a runway. I like to do a minimum of two weeks when I'm launching a new collection or product. Well, depends a little bit on the details. And then you can layer in your promotions and any recurring content you have. So if you do a weekly blog post or you do live sales on social media, layer those things in. And when you do that, you're already going to have way more emails than you thought you could send. Because when you talk about those promotions and those events, you're sending more than one email and we can talk about what that looks like. So when you start with this process, now let's say you are sending, maybe you've recently only been sending once a week. Maybe now you have two opportunities to email people every week but you notice there's a few holes. So like, how do you fill those in? Cause you wanna be consistent and get people used to hearing from you all the time. That's when you're gonna add in value added and lifestyle content. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about what those are. So if you think about one, what else does your customer care about related to your product? So if you sell jewelry, she probably cares about fashion and style and probably beauty. So you can start talking to her about that stuff and become a resource. If you sell fitness apparel, she probably cares about actual fitness and nutrition, right? <laughs> so you can kind of just fill in those spots with that type of content. But where do you get that content from? And how do you actually structure it? And that's where the T comes in. We're going to start telling some stories and they can be your stories or they can be stories of your customers. Doesn't really matter. You want it to obviously be related to your product, but stories, the reason why, and I know so many, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are probably sick of marketers telling them to like do storytelling, but there's a reason and that's because it works, right? And it makes people feel like they can relate to you and then they're nodding their head and they're like, oh yeah, she gets me or I feel like that too. And then they just become more connected to your brand. Mm -hmm. And so I love to use that. And then you've got the A is the adding value. So I kind of, those two kind of go together. And now, so you've got this calendar and then you can start plotting out all of the emails that you're going to send. And the R is really important because it stands for repeat, resend, and repurpose. So let's talk about the repeating thing because I know, and I struggle with this too. I always tell my audience, like when I am calling things out that we're doing wrong, it's because I'm doing it wrong too, <laughs> or I'm struggling with it also. Sure. Um, but I think we, we feel like we talk about our why we started our business or we're telling the same stories over and over again. And we're like, I just talked about this. Like, how can I talk about this again? But nobody is paying as close attention to us as we are. It's so true. <laughs> so we can't be afraid to repeat ourselves over and over again. And I, I always use this example of a post that I did on social media. I talked about when I was a little girl, I used to sleep in my new shoes. True story. And I shared this post and I had shared it multiple times before, but the most recent time I shared that someone commented and she said, oh my God, I used to sleep in my new shoes too. Like I thought I was the only one, but she had already been following me for two years. That was the first time she ever heard it or it clicked or it even showed up in her feed, right? Like who knows? So don't be afraid to repeat yourself. The people who already know it they're not going to say, oh, Larissa is telling me this story again. They're just going to tune it out. Like they don't care. Um, and if they do say that, they're probably not buying from you anyway. And they're sure. not your customers. So definitely eh, don't worry about it. And then the resend, this is where I think people get tripped up. And it's so funny because it's such a simple thing. But I've had multiple people tell me like, oh my gosh, you gave me permission to do this. And Email feels so much easier now. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you send an email. 
If you are stuck with what to say, one, go back in your archive, go like six months. What was an evergreen, so non-time sensitive message that you sent in the past that performed really well, whether that's because a lot of people replied to you or they made a lot of purchases. Just resend that email. You, you don't even have to change the subject line or the content because they're not going to remember that you sent it to them. <laughs> sure, yeah. So that's one part of it. But also when you're thinking about those product launches, those promotions, those events, like sending one email the day of is not enough, mm -hmm. right? We need to invite people. We need to tease them. We need to breadcrumb. So any big event in your business is probably a minimum of three emails. I always like, let's frame it around a promo that you're going to run over the weekend. At a minimum, you want to send a launch. You want to resend it to anyone who didn't click it the day before. And then you want to send a last chance. That's three emails right there for one topic. Totally. Right. And so that's going to fill up your calendar super fast. And then the last thing is to repurpose other content. How much time, energy, and effort do you spend creating content for Instagram that I think it's like 5% of your audience sees? <laughs> What if you took that content and you did a roundup? Here's what you missed this month or this week or something like that and just stuck it in an email. Now, you don't want to necessarily repeat everything, right? Because then people don't feel like they need to be in both places. But a lot of them aren't going to be in both places anyway. And the, you spend all this time creating this amazing content. Don't let it just sit on like the shelf collecting dust put that stuff out there. And maybe it's not your own content. Maybe you're doing a roundup of other people's content that you know is going to be valuable to your audience. And then you become the resource and people are going to stick around because they're like, sweet, I don't have to scour all the fashion blogs because Larissa is just going to send them to me. So though that's my star method. I I encourage everyone to send more emails than you're comfortable with. I kind of encourage everyone to kind of get to the limit of your comfort zone and then just go like a little bit outside of it, <laughs> step yeah. by step. So that's usually where the magic is at. That's a good tip. I especially like the last thing you said about um, repurposing content. It's something yeah. I talk about a lot. I don't have endless hours in a day. So I like to make the most of like the one effort that I put into like <laughs> communicating with someone. Yeah. So, I mean, it, like you said, if you're going to take the time to create awesome content, make that content work for you. I think the challenge I find with when I tell clients that, or I suggest that is like, wow, I never like thought about repurposing it in this way. So I think it does take a little bit of creativity and perhaps working with someone who yeah. does this for a living to help <laughs> like pull it out of you. But once someone does or helps you see that outside perspective of all the ways you could be repurposing the things that you're doing, it'll open up a lot of new potential for you. And not only just with email, but possibly help you to expand to other platforms like YouTube, for example. Yeah. Like if you're already putting, everyone knows that video content performs well on Instagram. I know so many small business owners who are like tripping over themselves, trying to make really amazing video content. And that's amazing, but like make it work for you. Like <laughs> Yeah. Put it on um, YouTube. YouTube is one of the biggest search engines. Ha yeah, get found in two. a new way. Um, one thing I just literally yesterday suggested to someone, like if you're doing an Instagram live, uh, maybe consider downloading that video, putting it through like an, uh, what is it called? AI, like transcription tool. So you can pull the text out of it. And yep. use that to make like a blog post, for example, which can only help you with your SEO. So 100% you're yep. literally doing no extra work except maybe like five minutes worth of work. And you are creating new opportunities for yourself to be seen and discovered in new ways. Yeah. Because here's the other thing too. We all consume content in different ways, right? I don't. So YouTube is the second largest search engine 
after Google, also owned by Google, right? Yes. I don't really go on YouTube, honestly. That's not my first place to go. If I'm trying to learn something, I actually prefer to read it. Sure. My husband spends hours <laughs> on freaking YouTube, like hours on YouTube. So I, if you have it only there, I'm probably never going to see it. Right. But if you repurposed it into a blog, I'm more likely to read it. Or maybe you broke it down over multiple captions on social media. Maybe here's, let me structure this easier for you. Let's think about a, you create a video and maybe if you're selling jewelry, you're going to talk about how to, how to mix and match styles, uh, how to mix and match metals. Blech. Sure. <laughs> right. And maybe you have like five main points. Well, those that's your whole piece, right? But then each of those points can become their own piece of short form content that maybe you turn into a reel or you do an Instagram live or something like that. They can also be broken out into a five part carousel. And you can take that same piece of content that you created. If you spread it out, you know, maybe it's every three months. So first it's a video, then you release the individuals. Then three months later, it's a carousel. Like nobody's going to remember that you talked about that. I've gone back and I've taken stuff off of Instagram from a year ago and literally just reposted the exact same thing because nobody remembers and you have new people coming into your orbit all of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Not only does nobody remember, but especially since you are presenting it in different ways and presenting it on different platforms, mm -hmm. most people won't notice, even if it's yeah. the same content because <laughs> it looks different. It's like a, what is that phrase? Like a wolf and sheep in wolf's clothing or a wolf in sheep's <laughs> right. clothing. You know what I mean? It's almost like you're yes. putting a disguise on it that yes. because in our digital world, we're so, we're not paying such close attention that someone's going to sit there and like analyze, Oh, like this, right. Is, you know, it's a flash decision that someone's making that's affected by the way it's being presented. Yep. And if you look at, and I, you know, I, this comes up a lot with reels, I think right now, since they are so popular, but if you look at some of the top product businesses that are killing it on reels, and these are two people that I know who last year, they actually changed around like their whole organizational structure so that they could become the content creator in their business. And I'm not saying you have to do this, but it's a great example. They are essentially saying the same message over and over and over and over and over again. Right. And they're just doing it to a different audio. Maybe they're switching up you know, the colors or whatever it is that they're doing, but it's the same thing. They're just talking about their product. So, and it's, they've blown up, but both of them blew up when they started doing this. So I think we, we get in our own head and we kind of overthink what this really needs to look like and be, and we're trying to be so intricate and that it doesn't have to be this way. Simplify it for yourself as much as possible. I'm a big fan of simplifying. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Totally. Love it. So when it also, when it comes to email marketing, oh, I can't even tell you how many questions I get. Larissa, how do I build my email list? Because <laughs> obviously if there's no one on your list and you're putting all yeah. this time into creating wonderful emails and the star um, met method, like it's going to fall on deaf ears. So how do right. you actually build a list? Do you have tips? Yeah, I sure do. The Yay. first thing is to think about what's in it for them, right? Why are they giving you their email? We have to remember that it's a human on the other side and they're getting a lot of other emails. So what is in it for them? You need to give them something. And sure, that can be a discount. And I, I know a lot of people are afraid to give discounts in exchange for an email. I don't think it's a bad thing. It's not training your customers to wait for a sale. It's just taking away some of the risk. So you have that option. But there's a lot of other ways you can do it as well. Like take, this is the one of the few times I recommend you take a page from like the, the online educational space is a free PDF about something that they're trying to solve, right? So it could be a style guide on mixing metals or stacking necklaces, something like that. Maybe it's a workbook to help them find their personal style. People will sign up for that. 
Um, and it's something you can test. I know of some other businesses that have actually tested the discount versus the PDF and the PDF actually does better right? Love it. for signups. Love and it. So that's an option. And then the other one and was really trending right now is quizzes. Create mm-hmm. a quiz. People, <laughs> it's so funny. Like we're busy, but we're also kind of bored. So if you can, <laughs> if you can gamify something for us, we'll be all over it. So quiz can be really fun and maybe it's helping them understand. Cause here's the other thing. Remember at the beginning of this, I talked about, you take your own knowledge for granted. Fun fact in a previous life, I was a fashion stylist. Nobody knows how to figure out whether they're cool or warm. Should I wear silver jewelry or should I wear gold jewelry? Right? So even something as simple as that, which you feel everyone in the world knows, guess what? They don't know. Yeah. So you could do something like that. Um, depending upon the style of the product that you sell, maybe you're kind of speaking to a few different customers. So it's like, what is your jewelry personality? There's so much fun stuff that you can do about around that. And what makes the quiz so amazing is you are getting zero party data from your customer. Like they're telling you exactly what it is that you want to know. Granted, this is a little bit easier if you think about skincare, right? So are you dry? Are you oily? Do you break out? That kind of stuff. But you can really do it in pretty much any industry. And if you use really great tools, they will integrate with your email marketing platform, hint, hint, pre-hook and Clavio. Uh, (laughs) I'm not sponsored by either one of them, by the way, Uh, but pre-hook will send all of that info to Plavio, which then you can use for segmentation and dynamic content and all of this cool stuff that you can do. Quizzes become this landing page essentially on your website, right? It's something you can send them to. So you can talk about it on social media, in your stories, and it gives them a reason to go somewhere else, right? Telling them to like, go find the pop-up on my website for 10% off your purchase when they're not even sure they want to purchase. That's a little bit harder to do, but for something like a free PDF download or a quiz that gives you something to talk about. Totally. Those are really great tips. I have a few thoughts about it too. Yeah. So with the quizzes also, um, because they take, I don't know what five minutes to fill out, but it's five more minutes that they are spending with your brand that they may not have otherwise. So they are engaging and you are also leaving them with a feeling. So uh, in a previous episode I just recently did, I talked about ways to have more fun with your marketing. Oh, I and love that. so a quiz is, it's fun, it's entertaining. And then subconsciously, whether that quiz taker realizes it or not, they just had like a boost of dopamine, like with your yeah. brand and they will go through the rest of their interactions with you kind of remembering that moment that they shared with you. <laughs> um, the other thing about quizzes, and I also just recently talked about this is that especially for millennial women who grew up with like magazines, yes, <laughs> like oh my Cosmopolitan gosh. and Teen I used Vogue to take all of those. Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? You took quizzes in those magazines. And I think it's a little bit of like fun nostalgia so that if your target customer is that person, it totally resonates with, with them because they have a good feeling around that, a nostalgic feeling. Yeah. And that's then, such yeah. a good, the nostalgia that's This is why, like, think about, think about the holidays, right? The, the scents, the food, all of that brings you back to like those cozy moments, those happy moments with your family. Um, Nostalgia sells really well. So that's such a great point. I'm going to have to steal that and start sharing that by the way. (laughs) I'll let everyone know when I take a quiz, because I, I'm a millennial woman. <laughs> so whenever I see a quiz, I'm like, oh, this reminds me of like Teen yes. Vogue or Cosmo or whatever. Yeah. And you know what else too? Like that's that that's the customer making a micro commitment and conversion with you. Absolutely. So as they take those tiny steps, they clicked the link, they went to your website, they filled out the quiz, they opened your email with their results. 
all of those are steps getting them closer to making a purchase because to go from you know initial click to purchase is really hard you have to build that relationship with them first and that's such an amazing way to do that i am going to steal the word micro commitment so <laughs> we're even now love it <laughs> love it this is why you need online business friends guys so i think we're actually <laughs> local to each other we figured out <laughs> yes and there was one other thought i had too about um the ebook download which i love and i am always telling people to do um but the pushback i get is larissa nobody reads anymore nobody wants an ebook well think you have to think more about it this way like say you go into a brick and mortar store or even let's talk about coffee again my yeah. favorite coffee shop has little free stickers that they like switch up the design all the time i don't need stickers Honestly, I'm probably not even going to use these stickers or put them on anything, <laughs> but they are free and they look yeah. cool. So guess what I am taking when I go to the coffee shop? I'm going to take a sticker with right. the ebook. Who cares if no one reads it? Right. The point is that someone's going to see that and be like, oh, cool, a free thing that I never saw before. I definitely have to download this. Mm -hmm. And guess what? You have their email address. Who cares if they don't read it? Cause they probably yep. won't honestly, because it's true <laughs> that people don't read things or they're just distracted and they forget about it and they move on to the next thing. But now they have made a micro commitment with you. As yes. You said. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And it's, you know, you do have to think about what that initial onboarding experience for those people are, right? You can't just like have them download the thing and then ghost until you have a sale, right? Definitely. You need that welcome and all of that good stuff to really create that relationships. But that's them giving you the opportunity to do that. And they're opening the door for you. Absolutely. So step, step on through, friend. Step on through. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So what are some big mistakes that you see in email marketing? The number one is not sending enough emails mm -hmm. for sure. Uh, just to give you a little framework around this is generally the bigger your list, the wider your product assortment, the more emails you can send, the more niche you are, the fewer emails. At a minimum, I'd love to see you sending at least one email a week you can slowly increase that, right? Maybe you send two emails for four weeks, check your numbers. If they're still good, then continue to do that. Increase it by one every time and see what happens. I used to send minimum of four emails a week, but not everyone was getting an email every day, right? Because mm -hmm. you're gonna segment out a little bit. Uh, sure. Depending on your business, maybe you just, exclude everyone who's purchased from you in the last 14 days, right? So once they make a purchase, you kind of leave them alone for a little bit. Another thing you can do to actually send more email is randomly split your list into two segments, 50, 50, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. Take the same email and split the send over two days. So you send it to, one half of the people on Monday, you send it to the other half on Tuesday. So this way you have people getting emails every day, but no one's getting an email every day. That makes sense. Um, so I used to do that as well. Ultimately, just figure out how you can send more emails, friends, please just do it. Uh, <laughs> most of the time when you send more email, you will make more money. The yes. other side of that is forgetting that it's a human on the other side of that email. Email is not a place to say, buy my product, buy my product. What about now? Do you want to buy it now? How about today? <laughs> right? We need to, if you go back to that star method, we need to add value and create a, an experience. And, you know, a lot of people ask me about like, well, should I do email or should I do SMS? It's not an either, or it's both because they serve different purposes. Email is where you get to build a connection, right? Create a relationship. If you're a really small business, encourage people to reply to you and start having conversations. Plus it's really good for your deliverability, which is conversation for another day. Um, and SMS is more of a notification channel. Hey, this went on sale. Hey, you left this in your cart. Hey, we got this new product. So it's not an either or. 
Um, but really just put yourself in the shoes of your customer and think about if you were in a brick and mortar, how would you talk to them? You would, they'd come in, you'd be like, oh my God, I love your shoes. The weather's really great. Look at what we just got, right? And you'd show them some of your best stuff. You'd ask them some questions. So try and recreate that experience in email if you can. Yeah, don't be a troll. Yeah. <laughs> and then you can also say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> don't hide behind your, your digital identity. Yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> So I want to touch upon, there's like so much we could talk about. I we know. could probably talk for hours and hours and hours. Hopefully this is still engaging to <laughs> listeners, but I definitely want to get to automations or at least um, the basics of automation. Yeah. So why is the automation part of email marketing important and which ones would you say are the most essential to have? Yes. And guys, if you tuned out, come back to us. This is, yes. this is probably the most important part of the episode. This is the most important part. We are yes. testing you because the <laughs> champions who get through this episode will get the true solid gold of it. <laughs> exactly. So automation is important for a few reasons, but one, it's how you actually make money while you, while you sleep and on autopilot, right? So it works for you. You don't have to be worried about it all the time. But two is they convert better generally because it's based on your customer's behavior. That's what triggers these emails to actually be sent. And there's something really, really powerful about that. And you can kind of liken it to ads, for instance. When people ask me like, oh, should I do Google ads or Facebook ads? I'm like, well, one, it depends a little bit on your product. But two, think about the experience on Facebook right? You're kind of looking at your nephews or you're reading the news or whatever it is. And then you have this ad, it just kind of interrupts what you were already doing there versus on Google, you're going there and you're searching for something specific. Mm -hmm. So email is kind of the same way. Those campaigns sort of interrupt whatever it is that you were doing while the automations are kind of there along the way with you, right? Because mm -hmm. you took some, the customer took an action. So that's why they're really important and shouldn't be ignored. And I know that it can get a little overwhelming and you feel like you need to have like all of these crazy conditional splits and all of this like cool funnel stuff. And you don't let's, let's keep it simple to start out. So the most important one really is the welcome because mm -hmm. that is your first impression with the customer. You want it to match whatever it is that you're giving away. So if it was the PDF, right, you want to kind of talk to them about what's inside so that they'll be more inclined to go read it. If it's the quiz, you want to email them their results, which in most cases should be the best products for them specifically. And then if it's the discount, don't get too crazy in that first email. Just give them the discount and get them back to your website to shop. <laughs> and then you can go in and introduce yourself, talk a little bit about why they want to buy from you, give them a little bit of the behind the scenes. And I know you think people don't care, but people are voting with their dollars. And as a small business, you are the thing that sets you apart and people want to support other people. So don't be afraid to share that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you can kind of get them like, Hey, come hang out with us on social and all that good stuff. So think about how you would talk to someone in person. What if you were at like a party or something like that? Think about that when you're creating that welcome. And then you also want to think about your abandonment email. So I think the most recent statistic, I think cart abandonment has gone up. It used to be average of 68% of people would abandon a cart. Now I think it's closer to 75. Mm -hmm. Whoa, that's a lot. So you definitely want those emails to bring them back. And that can be really simple. Hey, did you forget this? Because most people just got distracted, right? Absolutely. Uh, there's probably a kid pulling on their leg. Somebody called them, texted them, whatever. So you want that abandonment. And then the other most important one is your post purchase. So just because you got the sale doesn't mean that your job is done, especially for those first time buyers. This yeah. is your chance to solidify that relationship with this new customer so that they'll come back, leave you a positive review, right? And then shop with you again. So when I think about the content here, 
I'm going to ask myself, what does this customer need to know and understand to have a good experience with my product? There is something that you can educate them on, whether it's how to care for it, how to wear it, if you, I'll give you a couple examples. They're not jewelry examples, but it'll help illustrate this. I have a client who she sells handbags. She's got five main styles and then they all just have a bunch of different colors, but every bag really serves a different purpose. They're very feature and then benefit heavy. And so we sent information about each bag, how to use it, how to care for it, how to get a dent out of it. If you get a dent in your leather bag. Right. And what's funny is, and I knew this was going to happen. That was part of the intention, but she was actually on a podcast and she had mentioned how we had done this for her and that her customer service inquiries went down. Yes. So important because the time, energy, and effort that you spend replying to those customer service inquiries is just as important a metric in your business as your conversion rate is. So how can you decrease that? Because it's going to save you so much payroll time and even, or if it's you doing it, right? Another example is a, this was from my previous day job. There was this new product that came out in the industry. It was brand new technology. It was like a really big deal. Everyone was loving it. The bloggers were giving it insane, you know, reviews. We were selling them like hotcakes. And then we got all of these return requests. And we were like, oh my gosh, like what is happening? Because there was a little bit of a learning curve to using it. And we did not do our job in educating the customer. So what we found, and we figured this out because we went back and we looked at the data, right? We had all these customer inquiries coming in, chat, live chats coming in. And what we found is when the associate would kind of troubleshoot using it with them, and they would kind of get it. And then they would come back and say, okay, never mind. I'm keeping it. Right. And they were just as in love. So what did we do? We created a post purchase email. If they bought that product that explained all of this stuff to them ahead of time. And then all of that stopped and then people were in love with it. So, you know, the, if you're not sure what customers need to know, it's in your customer service inquiries. It's probably in your DMS on Instagram. It's in your bad reviews. It's all there for you. Those are two really good examples. I think that does a good job of illustrating <laughs> not only why it's important, but also like the types of content that can go in that yeah. post-purchase email. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, this has been an amazing conversation. <laughs> I know my listeners learned a lot and I love hearing this stuff because I think about a lot of it all the time. And it's <laughs> nice to hear someone else also reiterate it and even say it in like a different way that maybe right. reaches people that didn't like hear it before or get it yes. before. So it's, I think that's really good. Great. Is there anything else you would like to share? How can people find you? It's your time to shine, Jessica. <laughs> oh, thank you. The, I would say the one thing, like if you take nothing else away from this episode today. It's, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of our customer if we want to be a really good marketer. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that is your job, right? If you're going to be the CEO of your own company, you know, unless you're going to go pay a bunch of money for an actual good marketer, like we need to learn how to do this and you should learn it anyway. So people don't take advantage of you. Right. Um, and the best way to do that is to get really, really intimate with your customer. All of the other stuff matters, but if you don't have that as the foundation, then you're going to end up making the wrong decisions in your business. And if you're ever hung up and you don't know what to do, if you're indecisive, like me, if you overanalyze like me, just take those few steps back and say, okay, does my customer want this? Is this going to help them? And then you can, you know, move forward with your decision. And if you want to hang out with me more, I would love to have you. You can find me in all of the places <laughs> as e-commerce badassery. So that's my website, my podcast, my name on Instagram, all the places. And then I have a little free gift I'd like to share with the audience. Yay, great. 
Amazing. So if you go to ecommercebadassery.com forward slash Joya, J-O-Y-A, I have something special for you. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You're going to have to go there and find out. I don't even know what it is, so I'm going to have to go there myself. (laughs) Well, thank you, Jessica. This has been amazing. Um, Thank you for spending the time with me and for sharing all of your knowledge. Yeah, this has been a blast. Thank you so much for having me. What did you think about my interview with Jessica? If you want to hear more from her, you should definitely check out her e-commerce badassery podcast, which is available wherever you consume podcasts. You can visit her website, ecommercebadassery.com or follow her on Instagram at ecommercebadassery. As she mentioned, you can also claim your free gift for listening to or watching this podcast by visiting ecommercebadassery.com slash slash joya you can always email me larissa that's l-a-r-y-s-s-a at joyjoya.com if you love this podcast please share it with a friend who'd appreciate it and don't forget to subscribe as well as leave a review on itunes to purchase a signed copy of my book jewelry marketing joy visit joyjoya.com book for more information